Right. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for coming today for our talk on Muhammad uh, Ali and the Olympics. This is obviously a bittersweet time. We'll turn up here with passing this to James Williams on the prize. Um, but I think that he would have he enjoyed this program so much he would have wanted to continue. Uh, we'll miss him sitting over there and asking questions today. But uh, Candace Lee, the Deputy Athletic Director here at Vanderbilt, would like to say a few words before we begin the program. I think I just wanted to thank everybody for, and there are a lot of familiar faces here, and just thank you for supporting us for David. Um, it was certainly, and a lot of credit goes to Andrew for executing everything, but it certainly was David's vision to use um, the platform in athletics to really allow our reach to be expansive beyond just the support of our student athletes in the competitions, but also to connect sports to the world. And that's really the, uh, the impetus behind the Sports Society Initiative. I mean, I just felt like um, today of all days, with this being our first gathering since David passed away, and I, I know he was just, he's very appreciative of um, you guys making this feel like this was a worthwhile idea. And so allowing him to execute it, um, it just means a whole lot. So I just, I think, um, campus and our community are going through really a profound loss. But I do think that um, having opportunities like these to honor David is really important. So I just thank you for your attendance and for your participation. So I was just in Louisville this weekend, and I went by the Muhammad Ali Center and stopped at the gift shop so I could be prepared for today's talk. And I don't think there's any more um, interesting figure when you're talking about sports and society uh, to talk about than Muhammad Ali. And we have uh, two of the best people in the country that could be talking about this subject today with us. Uh, first, we have from Georgia Tech, Johnny Smith, came to Nashville for this program. Johnny is the author, co-author of this book, uh, Blood Brothers, on the relationship between Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. He grew up with uh, his mentor, Randy Roberts, from Purdue. And both Johnny and, and Professor uh, Whiting earned their doctorates at Purdue, so we might have a Boilermaker fight song right now during the talk today. And then uh, Dr. Gil Whiting is a professor here at Vanderbilt, and among many uh, things, he's teaching a course on Muhammad Ali, and I was asking him Earlier, if he allows people to audit that class, you might have everybody from this group to come <laughs> to your classroom. And he uh, has a collection of um, memorabilia and photos related to Ali. So thank you, uh, Dr. White, for bringing in your materials and your books. Everybody can take a look at these after the program. And he mentioned earlier that growing up as a kid, Muhammad Ali was someone that he really looked up to and understood his significance, not just as an athlete, but as a human being. So um, thanks to both of you for coming. I'm really looking forward to this program. Take it away. Well, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Good. 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 It's, uh, as was said by Candace, it's a bittersweet deal. On uh, Friday, we were, I was coming back from the airport with a rental car because we were taking about 50 Vanderbilt students down to Birmingham, Montgomery, and then to Selma. And weeks earlier, uh, David and athletes were down there doing the same thing. So it was kind of that thing. So myself and Dr. Noble, who runs the Black Culture Center, were taking students there for a Black History Month immersion excursion. It was 48 hours of tough, tough love, if you will. Uh, we visited so many museums and, and sites and walked the end of the bridge and went to the Wright Museum. So many things that this was bittersweet because I was driving home with the rental car in the text, the text was driving, but this popped up and I had to pull over. But I was like, this is not real. So it was, now, and part of me, I, was, I don't know if I said this to you, I might have said it to you, Johnny. I said, I wonder if you're going to cancel this event today. Stay with it because I was wrecked all week because I came coming here 16 years ago. Uh, David Williams and his family played a significant role in uh, our being here. And it's just amazing that even in 
2019, we're still talking about the first, you know, the trailblazer, the pioneer, those type of things. Those, those words are still interesting to me that uh, folks like Kenneth Ock, the first in this, uh, the first head black track field coach, you know, those kind of things right there for me are just phenomenally strange, particularly in light of what we just dealt with uh, and coming to the 50th anniversary of a lot of these events. So we'll, I'll try to keep moving along with it. And the um, way we're going to, just so you know, we're going to switch back and forth, uh, Professor Smith and I. I'm going to give a, a bit of background introduction. And I don't know how much you know about Ali, background, all that stuff there, but we're going to just work with it. We'll leave enough time for Q&A at the end, and hopefully that'll be where you can kind of engage. Um, a lot of our students, talking about Ali, they will remember something like this, black and white. You know, next thing you see him in that was 1996, right? And that's the only conception they have of, of Muhammad Ali. So what my work I try to do is try to take my students, both here at Vanderbilt and also the national community, to say how can I make Muhammad Ali, the lifetimes of politics, which is an in inner class, how can I make those things relevant and, and, and meaningful for kids today? Young, black, brown, low-income, other kids who actually, like I did, really learn and benefit from having a hero, if you will. I remember this, uh, well, I keep forgetting the name of the book. What did I say it was? Comic, comic book. It was a comic book. The reason why I'm called comic books is hot comic. And a uh, comic book was Superman versus Muhammad Ali, <laughs> right? And as a kid in the 70s, having this was like, oh wow, Muhammad Ali actually has superpowers. I mean, this guy actually flies, comes from a different country. Yeah, country too, but a continent or a space place, and uh, he's fighting Muhammad Ali, right? So Muhammad Ali's gonna be a bad boy, right? So for us, growing up, he was a superhero. And um, there was no understanding of what he had been through at that time because we're still living it. So what I do with my kids and what I want to talk about is just this one portion. And what that is, is during the time he's growing up in the 1950s, uh, 1940s and 1950s, we have to think about what is the backdrop, what is the soundtrack that's going on, what's playing in the background of so many people's minds. And so what I did was I went around and I looked at some things and heard some of the things that were playing and this was playing, so I want to digress one second here. Oh, 
And the message from Cassius Clay Sr. was one of frustration. And Cassius, who was a hard, Cassius Clay Sr., who was a hard drinking man. <laughs> who's a hard drinking man, sometimes turned violent in the home. Strike, Mrs. Clay, hit the boys. This is the world, the house that Clay grows up in. But outside of that home in Louisville is a segregated city where Cassius is boxed in by the color line. And what his father tells him time and time again is a message of, don't go into the white neighborhoods. Don't trust the white man. Avoid the police. There's a dangerous world out there. And he points to the story of Emmett Till. But he didn't have to look as far as Mississippi to understand racial violence. In 1954, in Louisville, a black family, they move into a previously all-white neighborhood. And the white folks there in Louisville, some of them, did not embrace this family, the Wades. And one night when the Wades left, these bigots planted dynamite in this home, blew up the house. So Cassius Clay, young Cassius Clay, what does he see in his world? He's got a father who tells him basically that his dreams are pure fantasy. He sees in the murder of Emmett Till a boy who looks like him who ends up in a casket. And he sees that in Louisville, the white folks don't want you around. So we have to ask ourselves, why does he turn to boxing? Yes. There's the, the story of the bicycle that's part of it. But we also have to understand that young Cassius Clay turns to boxing, a violent sport, as a response to the violence around him. You know, boxing offered him not just an, an avenue for fame, for being a somebody, but it was there in the boxing gym where he could hit the speed bag. He could hit the heavy bag. He could hit his opponents and unleash his frustration and his anger. And so boxing means something to this young black teenager growing up in segregated Louisville, Kentucky. So keeping that in mind, that he's a dreamer, let's fast forward to the summer of 1960. Cassius Clay is 18 years old. He's 6 foot 1, 180 pounds, dripping wet. He is a Golden Gloves champion, he's an AAU champion, and he's going to go to Rome to fight in the Olympic Games as a light heavyweight. His dreams appear to become true. Before flying to Rome, Cassius and his teammates on the boxing team, they go to New York. And when they're in New York, they meet up with a, a sports writer, Dick Shack. Some of you may remember him. His son, Jeremy, works for ESPN. Dick Shack meets with Young Cassius Clay and his teammate says, let's go to Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in America, and let's go see if Sugar Ray is around. Sugar Ray Robinson. The great Sugar Ray Robinson. Young Cassius can't wait. His hero is Sugar Ray Robinson. Even though Cassius is bigger than Sugar Ray, he sees himself in Sugar Ray's image, right? And what is that image? Sugar Ray is Miles Davis cool, right? a little unapproachable, he's got some swagger, an entourage follows him around, and in Harlem he was, he was the emperor of Harlem, right? And what did Sugar Ray have? He had a garage full of Cadillacs, colorful cars, just like Cassius Clay wanted. So Dick Shack takes Cassius and the other boxers down to Sugar Ray's restaurant to see if he's, he's there. He's not around. So what do they do? They take a tour of Harlem. 124th and 7th Avenue, and there's a soapbox speaker standing, espousing the rhetoric of the nation of Islam, black nationalism. And young Cassius Clay hears this soapbox speaker talking about black advancement and black independence, buying black, and the white man is dangerous. Don't trust the white man. Cassius Clay, he He's never heard something like this in public, maybe in his own household. He's heard something like this message from his father. And he turns to Dick Shack and he says, 
isn't he going to get in trouble criticizing white people in public standing on that stage? Now let's think about this reaction. When we think about Muhammad Ali years later, who becomes an outspoken voice in the black freedom struggle, confronting white supremacy, these are very, two very different images from young Cassius Clay, 18 and 1960, and the one that we come to know much later in the later 60s. So this moment makes an impression on young Cassius, but he's not there to hear the soapbox speaker. He's there to meet Sugar Ray. So they go back to Sugar Ray Robinson's restaurant. He's there, bright purple car, parked out front, OK? Cassius meets Sugar Ray, he signs an autograph, and afterwards, Cassius is just gushing about Sugar Ray Robinson. You've got to think about that Cadillac parked out front. What did the Cadillac mean to young Cassius Clay? Was it about status? Perhaps to some degree. Was it about success? Perhaps to some degree. I think there's something larger here we have to understand about 18-year-old Cassius Clay in 1960. Is that those cars were about mobility. You know, if Cassius Clay could get behind the wheel of a Cadillac or have a chauffeur, as he dreamed and told Dick Shack all about, then he could go anywhere he wanted. Then he could be more like Sugar Ray, he could be a free man. And so we have to understand that Cassius's dreams are tethered to the idea that success in boxing will give him a kind of freedom that he cannot enjoy in Louisville. Because the white folks in Louisville aren't going to allow him to move into their neighborhood. Okay, so he's gone to Harlem. He meets his hero. Now what does he have to do? He's got to get on a plane and fly across the Atlantic Ocean, and he is in a panic. He has a paralyzing fear of flying. So they give him a sedative, try to quiet young Cassius down. You know, he's talking about how he's going to whoop everybody across the world. Anybody, bring him on. Bring on the Russians. Bring on the Poles. He is ready. And the sedative's doing nothing. And so he's yapping his way, and he says to his teammates, you know, if God wanted us to fly, he'd give us wings. And one of his teammates says to him, well, we're flying now, so what do you have to say about that? And Cassius just kept on talking. He gets to Rome, okay? Lands his feet on the ground. He feels much safer now. And when he's in Rome, he's not the most famous Olympian. It's easy for us to look back now because he's probably the most famous athlete in history around the world and say that, oh, well, that was the beginning. Not exactly. In 1960, when Clay goes to Rome, he's part of really a black delegation of athletes. And he's not the most famous one. Wilma Rudolph is there. Oscar Robertson, the great basketball player, Hall of Famer, he's there. But really the star of the 1960 Olympics is Rayford Johnson, UCLA grad, decathlete. And Rayford Johnson plays a pivotal role in the 1960 Olympics. He would be the first African American to carry the American flag in the opening games. He's at the head of the line, okay? That there tells you something about the message that the United States government wants to transmit to the world. Cassius Clay spent time around these black athletes. In 1960, 25% of the black women on the U.S. Olympic team, excuse me, 25% of the women on the U.S. Olympic team were black, 12% of the men on the U.S. Olympic team were black. But he's part of this larger group that are powerful figures in the world of sports. He doesn't necessarily fit into that world yet, but he aspires to. Now, when Rayford Johnson is carrying that flag at the front line, it sends a message. And it's one that's intentionally created. This is all about creating narratives for the public to consume. And the narrative is that these athletes are symbols of racial progress. They're symbols of democracy, right? Now, by putting Rayford Johnson front and center, and these other black athletes front and center, it also opened up criticism of the United States. This is the Cold War, right? And now these games in Rome, they're not just games. These are contests for ideological supremacy, a battle between two systems. And for the United States, which under the State Department, under the US Olympic Committee, used these black athletes, held them up, propped them up as symbols of racial progress. In response, the Soviets said yes, you have these integrated Olympic teams, integrated sports teams in your country. 
But what about the hypocrisy of your government? A government that does not protect black people, right? And it was easy for the Soviets throughout the 50s to attack the United States. A time in which, in particular, the US and the Soviets were fighting to build relations with various African countries. And so this is all part of the international politics of the moment. We cannot separate the Olympics from the Cold War or the Civil Rights Movement. And what's really critical in understanding Cassius Clay's presence in 1960 is that the State Department, the United States Olympic Committee, they used these athletes as goodwill ambassadors. They were representatives of the United States. That means that they were coached in a different way. They were coached to answer questions about America's racial problems in a way that diminished the conflicts back home. And so they were coached in a way to toe the party line. <clears throat> now when Cassius is in Rome, he's in the Olympic Village, and it's integrated. <clears throat> the quarters where he stays are integrated. In Rome, he experiences a kind of freedom that he didn't experience in Louisville. In Rome, he could travel without worrying about bigots beating him, about the police pulling him over. He has a kind of mobility there. And what does he do with this freedom? When he's in Rome, he's interested in talking to everybody, right? I know that surprises you. And when he's there, he wants to meet the athletes from Africa, in Europe, in South America, in Asia. And they would exchange these trinkets, these national pins. And that was his introduction to the world. And he liked it. He liked talking to these athletes. He liked talking to these reporters. At one point when Clay is in Rome, a reporter from a communist country interviews him. and says, uh, Cassius, how do you feel about the problems of the color line back in your country? Cassius stands up strong, shoulders back, head up, and he says, I'm not worried about that problem. We've got qualified people working on it, and the USA is the best country in the world, including yours. Now think about this statement. He clearly is embracing the idea of American exceptionalism. He's also deferring on the problem. He doesn't see himself as an active participant in the solution. He's not saying, I'm one of the qualified people. I'm going to challenge the color line, or when I win the Olympic gold, it's going to change race relations in Louisville. He doesn't say anything like that. Qualified people are working on the problem. Now, he's 18 years old, okay? He would later explain that he had once participated in a protest in Louisville, and some angry white woman dumped hot boiling water on him, and he said it was the last time that he would pick at anything. He did not see himself in 1960 as an agent of protest. That was not a role that he saw for himself. But when he answered this question, he embraced a particular role, what would have been referred to then as a quote unquote good Negro. He's deferential on civil rights. He's passive. He does not see himself as someone who is going to be an agent of change. And so in that way, Cassius embraces the government line. Keep that in mind for a moment. Now, when he is in Rome, he's going to have to win four matches to win the gold, and he will do that. I'm not going to get into the details of the fighting. Um, but what I do want to say, make sure I haven't forgotten anything. I think I've covered, oh, I told you this thing was going to be difficult. Uh, I wanted to make sure I didn't forget anything. Yes, that's right. So, I don't know. Uh, so in 1960, when he makes this statement, we should think about what else is happening in America. What's the soundtrack? It's the year of the sit-ins. If you think about what's happening in the South, in cities like this, in Nashville, black young people, Cassius' age, are putting their bodies on the line. Courageous college students who are saying, we are going to be part of a direct action movement. Now that's not yet where Cassius Clay is. He doesn't see himself as a protester. But there's a mythology around the Rome Olympics with Cassius Clay. 
And the mythology is, is that when he comes back from Rome, gold medal, proud, wearing his Olympic jacket, metal dangling around his neck, he returns to Louisville, and he goes to a segregated diner, and he's declined service. White man across the counter and tells him they don't serve his kind. And Cassius Clay storms out of the diner, rips off the metal, and tosses it to the Ohio River. An act of defiance, an act of resistance. There's just one problem with this story. It never happened. This story of Cassius Clay coming back from Rome, furious that he's been forced to deal with segregation as if he wouldn't have expected this to happen having grown up in Louisville, and he throws his medal, which was his most cherished possession, uh, is hard to imagine. That story was first written in 1975 when Muhammad Ali published his autobiography, The Greatest. And the idea behind this story was to show that Ali had always been at the front lines of protest. But that's not really true. The fact is that he lost the medal. He lost it. So what happens now? He comes back to the United States. And all he talks about is that dream of his. He is determined to turn pro. And he does in late 1960. Between 1961 and 1964, America witnesses the transformation of Cassius Clay and how he became Muhammad Ali. Now, I've written about this transformation at length with my colleague Randy Roberts, book plug. Uh, it's called Blood Brothers, The Fatal Friendship Between Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. So I'm not going to speak at length about that because that's not really the focus of the event. But I do want to say this. In those years, between 1962 and 1964, from the time that he meets Malcolm X and starts attending meetings, uh, uh, Nation of Islam meetings, he begins to think about the world from a different perspective. The ministers in the Nation of Islam, they teach him about the principles of black nationalism, which is built on the pillars of racial pride, pride in your blackness and self-determination, or independence. Well, over the course of 62 and 63 and 64, increasingly Cassius Clay becomes more independent. The, the pattern for African-American athletes, if they wanted to maintain a successful career, was not to be controversial, was not to talk about social issues or politics. And from the time that Cassius Clay embraced the world stage in Rome, he seemed to fulfill that image. But behind the scenes, when he's attending these meetings with Malcolm X and the other ministers inside the nation of Islam, he's thinking that perhaps he's been fed a lie. And so in 1964, when he wins the heavyweight championship in Miami, defeats Sonny Liston, he makes a declaration of independence. Malcolm X is there. And he tells the press, I don't have to be who you want me to be. This was a revolutionary statement. He said, I'm free to be who I want to be. Well, what did that mean? In 1964, he tells the world, I am not a Negro, I'm a black man. I am not a Christian, I am a Muslim. And after he wins a title, he says, I'm not Cassius Clay, I am Muhammad Ali. That is my original name, I denounce my slave name. And the world of boxing is in a panic. Because now there's this widespread fear that Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay or whatever he wants to call himself is going to recruit kids into the nation of Islam, which was seen as this racist cult of violent movement. But you have to understand that over the course of 64 and 65 and 66, and in 67, when Muhammad Ali refuses induction into the United States military, for those who didn't embrace or accept the theology of the nation, Muhammad Ali was an incredibly powerful and appealing figure. He was a man who was authentic. He was powerful. He spoke his mind. He was someone who embodied racial pride. Think about what he was saying before he was champion, I am the greatest. 
Think about that. Most reporters and boxers thought, this kid Clay is obnoxious. He's annoying. I am the greatest. You haven't won anything yet. A lot of black folks heard something else. When Cassius Clay said, I am the greatest, he said that a black man is the best at something. That was inspiring. That was uplifting. That's what moved people to cheer for him, even if they disagreed with his membership in the Nation of Islam. So when we think about this transfor transformational moment, I point to 1964, when he becomes champion, when he travels to Africa, and he goes to Ghana, and Nigeria, and Egypt. And there, when he's in Ghana, he rejects the State Department's party line. There, the government is afraid of Muhammad Ali, because it's in Ghana he tells the world, America is a violent place. Black people are killed and lynched, and there's no consequences for white murderers. It's a very different image, a very different message from the man who in 1960 said there are qualified people working on the problem. Well, by the time he becomes champion and embraces the world stage in Africa, he sees himself as one of those qualified people. I'm going to stop there. Sorry about the mic. I think it's your turn. Okay. Yeah. I was enjoying it. I was taking notes. Oh, okay. I was enjoying it. That was great. Okay. Oh, I can see you have a good workout. Yeah, I do. You've got to lose weight somehow. <laughs> I was telling about my gym in the house. Yeah. He said, I got to come there and work out at your gym. I said, come on. It's a good place to be. Well, uh, it's easy to follow that because I think you, you teed up it perfectly. I, I admire your energy and the storyline. It made you feel like you're walking with Ali like you want to do. So where we leave off, of course, is dealing with one of the most turbulent times. It's very interesting to understand that sports and the military have a lot in common. Sports and military. These are places where men prove their manhood. The Uber mentioned, who's the best? Talk about Rayford Johnson. The decathlon itself, the 10 day, 10 event, two day uh, uh, competition, said who was the man, right? And so you have Ali, who has now come right up against all the things that are going on in the 1960s, the mid-1960s. You name it, we've all saw it. We've seen the bombs in Birmingham. We're seeing all these things happen around the world. He's been radicalized, as they say now, or he's actually come into his own. So 1967, 68, Vietnam hits us. Right? It was already going on, but we see it now, the protests, the college campus protests. You have Muhammad Ali speaking at Notre Dame, telling college students, now he becomes a threat. He's watched by the FBI. He's watched by all of these folks because they're also watching that 7th uh, uh, Street church there in uh, New York called Muslim Mosque Number 7 which he's a part of because this is Malcolm's X, this is Elijah, this is before they moved Chicago. So there's a lot of stuff going on right now, and Malcolm, I mean, and Martin now becomes pretty much one of these public enemies, but we can't say it out loud. What do we do with him? How do we shut him down? Well, I'm going to jump a little bit ahead to 1968. There's another Olympic Games going on now, getting ready for it, right? We've moved out 1960. 64 seems to be quiet. For some reason, we don't have a lot of things. We said there's three Olympics, in my mind, three Olympics that really stand out. I would say it'd be 1936. I mean, we can say all of them do stand out because they're just unique in that. The absence of them stand out as well in the 1940s. The fact that they weren't there stands out. But there's no doubt that 1968 was something else. There's a book I teach in a class, uh, Something in the Air. And it talks about all of the athletes and their relationships and their fun and, and Harvard rowing team dealing with the Tennessee Tiger Bells and how Wilma Rudolph and the captain of uh, the, the rowing team actually, she, he goes out with her to go shopping for lingerie. And there's just weird kind of things that just these little stories like, what? How? Let me read that again. How does that work? So there's really human youngsters out doing these things in other places in the city. Just came back from Mexico City uh, around New Year's and had a chance to go to the Olympic Stadium that they built there and got the story behind the story about all of the protests that were going on in building of the stadium 
and the people and the uh, students who were actually killed during that time to build this stadium because they did not want the Olympics there. Had the walls painted over, much what they did in Brazil just recently, as a matter of fact. And they pushed the people back, cordoned off the areas. And you have the Olympics going there in 1968. There's something afoot out in California. We don't quite know what it is yet, but there's this guy by the name of Harry Edwards. And Harry Edwards becomes one of the architects of the infamous, I don't have that picture with me, but I have another one like that with Tommy and John standing there on podiums one and two with their buttons on. We said the symbols that are there that show that there's something going on, a press people's movement that's happening back in the United States. This is the backdrop that Muhammad Ali, as a young man, is now growing up into. We've got the point where he once goes, uh, before he announces his uh, new found religion, he actually does go to the Selective Service and they find out that he was not eligible for the draft. He's not eligible. Flat foot something, I don't know, can you imagine that? Something's wrong with him physically, he can't go to a draft. He's reclassified, he goes back again, and now all of a sudden he's eligible for the draft. Now it becomes the, probably the biggest scene, because like I said, in the 1960s, we're looking at this person wins, comes home, but unless you and unless you know the team and where he scored on the team, you wouldn't even recognize him there. It was the moment when he comes pro, he wins in 1964 in Miami, he declares himself no longer Cassius Clay, but Muhammad Ali. Now we have him standing up and saying, I'm not going to fight for this country because of my religious back, back beliefs. We heard a story that he talks about a bit calming than nothing to me. More happens to me and my people here in this country it happens to me over there. So you're not going to send me halfway around the world, probably because he wants to get on a plane again, but you're not going to send me halfway around the world to fight against brown people that ain't done nothing to me. This was his, his kind of thinking. So you have that going on. You have the Nation of Islam, which is starting to recruit, as a matter of fact, in the early, in that, in that period of time, and growing in popularity, and growing in hate, as a matter of fact. So now you have this, the Olympics going on in uh, Mexico City, you have Harry Edwards, Harry Edwards who is saying that, you know something, we're going to have a protest. But I'm going to leave it up to you to decide, because they had all this thing where they wouldn't go, who's going to go, who's not going to go, let's boycott. All these kind of conversations took place that happened. They all decided to go, and what they decided was go ahead and do your own thing. What, what are you going to do? So as the story happens, the wives of these guys, somebody brought a pair of gloves, one of the wives or whatever, there's a left one and a right one and they decide to do this thing. Now, we all have seen the, the, the fallout, the rushing of them. Anybody have not seen the video of what happens to these two young men when they hold their fist up? Anybody not see what happened to them? I'll give it to you. So after they decide to do this, you could hear, they said you could hear the wind blowing around their fist. It was so quiet there. And somebody in the background says, oh, shit. I cannot believe they're doing this. This quiet hush came over the whole stadium as the music playing in the background. As soon as they got off the stand, you can see the undressed figures. You can see the shoes sitting on the side of the podium. You can see all these things. So now this, this, this thing that Muhammad Ali is dealing with back in the United States has now hit the international stage. As soon as they get off the stage, the platforms, they walk out, they're escorted right out, right back to Olympic Village and, and told to get out. That's it, you're going. I'm playing, you're out of here in 24 hours, you're out of here. And somebody asked, well, see that you're kicking them off the team, you're kicking them out of the village, you're kicking them out of the country, are you still going to count their medals in the medal count? Of course they did. They yeah. took their medals back, but you still counted their medals in the medal count. So you sent them back home. And that's changed these two men's life. There's a whole talk on these two by themselves. <coughs> but so now we get back to Muhammad Ali. He's saying, no, I'm not going to this war. I'm looking at the conditions of people, not only in Louisville, not only in New York, but now I'm looking all around the country, everywhere. Yes, I am a person now that everybody knows, so I can actually look down and see what's happening in the lower south. I can look what's happening in the inner cities of Boston and New York. I can see all of these things, and I have now a platform to talk about it. So you have one of the most popular ministers next to Malcolm X now is a world-class athlete. You have people like we don't talk about it, but Lou Alcindor, who becomes Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who transfers. 
So now you see these athletes, you have Jim Brown, you have a lot of these what I call activist athletes who are now coming out and speak of, speaking out for economic development, housing, uh, education, all of these things. And this is the platform now that Muhammad Ali is riding. He says, I'm not going. So what do they do to him? Well, we're going to charge you. We, they talk to the ministers. He goes into a room with his ministers <coughs> and they say, well, look, we don't mind if you go to war. The nation of Islam tells them, we don't mind if you go fight. But he says that that's not our belief. We don't do that. So after he comes out, he's in his meeting with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, uh, Jim Brown, all of these famous athletes at the time, they have this big meeting, and they come out, they report to the news that says, after uh, you know, a meeting with uh, Muhammad Ali, we come to see that he's firm his conviction and why he's not going, and we stand and we support him. At that moment, the lightning rod goes up, he becomes persona non grata, he now, they strip him of his title, and now here he is. And we have to think about this. This is a young man who is at the height. Boxing is not a career that you can have like at least 21 years. That's not something you do. You, it's like a football career. You might have it three or four years, and if you get to the top of it, you, once you lose a top, you never get back. This is a man who got back there three times. So there's something phenomenal about him. So we have this taken away from him at the height of his career. And for the next three years, he can't fight anywhere. He can't fight, he can't travel, he can't do a lot of things because now he's worried about whether or not he's going to be going to jail for five years and pay fines. So this is the, this is the, the 1968 Olympic time frame. While this is going on, from 1967, 1970s, before he came gets his boxing license back, this is when Ali starts to really reflect and he becomes stronger in his conviction of his religious beliefs. He now, if he does get back, I believe, if he does get back to that boxing stage, which we know he does, there's nothing that's going to change him now. He's already called the Louisville Lip, which was one of his original names, but now he's, he's convicted, uh, he's, he's, he's fully entrenched into who he is as a personality. There's one thing I want to share. I brought a lot of these just so we can play them later on, or look at them anyway. But there's one called The Trial of Muhammad Ali. And it's a video. And in there, it really is something that we want to try to take a look at. Because why did they give him his license back? Why? Why did they just not keep it rescinded forever? Politically, what was going on as far as high as the White House got involved in this thing because Muhammad Ali was just that popular, it was becoming a political nightmare. So they just said, you know something? Let's just cut it. It's all over. Now he's reinstated. And he looked a lot of places to box while he was he couldn't box anywhere. Las Vegas, New York, everybody had sanctions against him to box. So they took away the prime years of his life because of his convictions and his uh, religious beliefs. So now we move past that, we get him into the early 1970s, he comes back out to stop fighting again. I want to segue here now and, and stop there. Okay. Stop there. What we're trying to do is tie Ali back from his childhood into when we meet him in 1960, we learn about him, look at him between 60 and 64, 68, and then talk about him in terms of his career during that time, the Vietnam War, and then turn it over now and leave enough time to talk. You want to wrap something up? Yeah, I can so I gave you a lot of. How much? I put you in the middle so you can walk as far as you want. Now. Just hold on to that. Okay, I'll just hold that. I'll put it. I'll put it. How would you want to time, Andrew? You have. About 30 minutes total, so we're going to lose some time for questions. Okay, Sorry. I'll keep it brief then, this last part. We started by talking about Cassius Clay, the Rome Olympics in 1960. But for many of us, me especially, I knew Muhammad Ali as a child seeing him in 1996, lighting the Olympic torch, shaking, suffering from Parkinson's disease. It's a powerful moment. As a historian, I look at it as a turning point and how we have memorialized Ali, how we remember him. There's a couple reasons for that. Number one is the Ali who appeared in Atlanta in 1996, the Louis the Lip, was long gone. You know, he had been robbed of his verbal gifts. How cruel, right? The Louis the Lip could no longer rhyme and rap and 
spout poetry the way he once did. There's something else more profound that we should remember about that moment is that in that silence there was a void. And in the aftermath of the 96 Olympics, that void was filled by writers and filmmakers who created new narratives about Ali, who he is and what he was. And what happened is that in the 20 years between the 96 Olympics and 2016 when he died, that period really influenced the way Americans have remembered Ali as this universal hero. But in the process of transforming Ali into a universal hero, what was lost was the man who existed in the 60s. Suddenly, Americans suffered from historical amnesia, forgetting the fact that Ali in the 60s was without a doubt the most hated black man in America. He was a polarizing figure. He was not a symbol of unity. He was not seen as a figure of world peace the way he was in 1996 through 2016. That was not his image. Rather, what happened in that moment is suddenly, after 1996, now the media is interested in him again. Corporate, uh, corporations are interested in using his likeness. Michael Mann produces a biopic about Ali's life starring Will Smith, right? I'm sure many of you have seen this not so great movie. In this film, Michael Mann uses great creative license to portray Ali as heroic. But he does it in a way where he suggests that Ali practiced Orthodox Islam in the 1960s, which he did not. He was a member of the Nation of Islam, which had this esoteric religious views. Uh, I'm not going to get into all of it, but basically Americans rejected, many Americans they rejected the Nation of Islam. They saw it as anti-Christian, they saw it as a violent cult, terrorist group, all of these, all of these things. So, after 1996, the film comes out in 2001. There's growing interest in Ali, okay? Fast forward to 2016, Ali dies. And I'm reading all of these op-eds and memorial pieces about his life. And I'm reading nonsense. I'm reading people who are writing about a man that they don't know. And what, what I read was this idea that Muhammad Ali transcends race. The idea that Ali transcends race and that he was always this unifying figure who brings people together of all different backgrounds and religions. This was the new myth. And we have to ask ourselves, why is it now that white people who love Muhammad Ali criticize Colin Kaepernick want to elevate Ali as a figure who transcends race and advance that mythology. Well, I would suggest it says more about us as a country today and the way we appropriate Ali's image and his memory, that we remain a country that struggles to confront this nation's history with racism and that same disease that plagues our country to this day. Muhammad Ali did not transcend race. He changed his name. He became a Muslim. He spoke out against white supremacy and confronted the government because he was a black man living in a segregated country. He was the embodiment of black power. He did not transcend race. But he has been whitewashed to the point that many Americans don't understand his legacy and how he became really this figurehead in the revolt of the black athlete, and why his legacy remains so relevant. And I think we have to grapple with that. And so I'll stop there and turn it back over to Dr. Whiting, um, because I know he wanted to say a few words about his relevance, particularly for youth who may look to his story as a source of inspiration. So you know <clears throat> what we try, what I try to do, that is not we, but what I try to do is to take a is to take a uh, situation that has a certain degree of relevance. See if you can keep this on. Mm -hmm. 
to take a certain degree of relevance uh, that has lost, been lost in time and see if there's any use for it in another context. So what I try to do is I take the, the ideas and the resilience and the stick to itness that Muhammad Ali displayed and work with kids to try to get them to uh, see the value of it in today and to turn the stick in, in, into school. So we, uh, we being a program in the, in the community in Nashville called Why We Can't Wait. And of course, that's one of the uh, books from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And in that book, we talk about, there we go, so that's just back up. So in that book, he talks about when we're going to do something, how long we're going to wait until that thing happens. So it's about being present and about being on, in the moment. Research has shown recently that just looking at the faces of black children actually put people, white people that is, in a heightened state of fear. Now, think about that for a second. Because I know that, that picture is from a, a plantation penitentiary system down in Louisville, uh, Louisiana uh, some years ago. Uh, but this is actually from uh, some research just as recent as 2015. Also, we see that uh, black and brown girls, uh, recent books pushed out, are being pushed out of school and being uh, suspended and expelled at higher rates than any other groups in the country. We even see that even though research says that there's extra policing in schools, it's not because of uh, uh, school insecurity because of the uh, the dangers in school, but because of the population at that school. So as an education person, I have to look at some of the statistical data and see that uh, black girls versus white girls 53 more times likely. This is out of New York, but it's all across the country. We're doing a big uh, study right now. Uh, uh, 10 times more likely for boys. And then you've got suspension rates uh, nationally uh, that are there. So these things that we're looking at, one in three, one in six, one in 10, and one in 53, make me say, okay, what can I do? I'm in, the, I'm in my shoes now as an adult. I came out of Boston and I was a recruited track and field athlete and a swimmer. And I had offers from Bowdoin, Maine, who would ever want to go to school there, um, <laughs> all the way down to Florida. And I decided to go, I didn't go to school, couldn't go to school anywhere, uh, plus the 20, 30 schools that are in Boston. I decided to go to the University of Rhode Island because I had an older brother ran track there and another one played football there. I had a collaboration between there and Brown. And I know that my athleticism helped me to meet somebody like Johnny because I was forced to be in a room, a roommate, and understand and learn who he was and what he was outside of what I've been told. So athletics allowed me to do some of those things. And it also allowed me a chance to get away from my surroundings and my environment to actually learn something. So it's kind of like Ali moving from Kentucky up to New York to see a bigger picture. And then it was also for me uh, going from college, watching all of the athletes who were getting ready to graduate, but they weren't going anywhere after that. They weren't going home. And I ran for a New Balance Track Club for like 25 years and all that stuff, so I had sponsors and I could travel around and run, but I knew that was going to end. And there was really no money in track, by the way, unless you ran in Europe. Uh, I'll tell you a story about Carl Lewis one time, but that'll be later. Uh, this guy had, he actually won a race, I'll tell you, he won a race down in, uh, it was the Olympic Holiday down in Berlin. Uh, and he actually won, and the first place prize was this red Porsche. He got, and this is back in 1986. And he set a track record and all that kind of stuff there. He was either doing 100 or long jump or something, he did it all. But he wins this car, and he can't take the car back for real, because we really couldn't do that. They give you gifts. And so he did, he sold the car for $55,000, and that's what he got. So he didn't break his amateur status. And that's the way they had to make money back then, right? So that was a side part right here. Okay, so now I'm at the end of my college career. I'm like, what do I do next? Well, uh, I'm not going back home to Boston or Providence. Um, what do I, I jump in the ROTC. So the next 10 years, I become a military officer, and I'm traveling around Europe, running for the All Army Track Team training at Presidio up in San Francisco and doing all those things there. I get to Europe for three years later, I'm taking bricks out of a wall, right? This is the 50 year anniversary of the wall coming down in Berlin. So I have, athletics have taken me all these places, but also in the military, again, I got a chance to share 
foxhole with people that I would not have at another time. In, in the beginning, I talked about the military and all athletics. So that's why I'm a big proponent for it. But what do we do with these kids right now when we have something, somebody whose value was Al Ali, or somebody's value is one, how do we make those things relevant? <coughs> My education model talks about some of the things that Ali had shown me coming up, his efficacy. He believed that he could do that. He talked about being a heavyweight champion when he was 90 pounds. Believe that. That's not only efficacy, but that's future orientation. He thought about what he was going to be in the future. He thought about willing to make sacrifices. What was he going to give up to actually move to the next level? He's going to sacrifice his time with his friends, hanging out, chasing after girls if that's what they did. Whatever he was going to do, he gave those things up. He was actually even talking about willing his internal control. When he didn't do something, he didn't blame it on someone else. He took responsibility for his own action. <coughs> he had to know himself. There's a degree of self-awareness that he had to have to understand what he wanted to do. Then we look at the self-awareness, achievement grade and affiliation. Did you know research says that most of our kids that are doing polling in school would rather pick six friends than six A's? I'm teaching at the university here. We try to tell them, look, when you graduate, you're going to get a degree that's going to have one name on there that's going to be yours. So make sure you pick your friends wisely. And the next one's up there, click uh, academic self-confidence. Well, in this case with Ali, we're talking about his, because uh, this is a scholar identity model. So I work with the kids of scholar identity. But in this case, this would be his, his athletic uh, confidence that he was using. Race consciousness was something that in a lot of schools, we believe that, <coughs> oh, I stepped in something. Let me wipe that off my feet and go into a school building. But we know that race transcends school buildings. It goes in, out, and around. So how do we talk about Ali, his race posture, and what he knew about himself as a person who has been identified because of the color of his skin, the accident of birth, how do we use that in a positive light? And then lastly, masculinity or gender issues. How do we talk to these young men about, and these young ladies, about what it means to be in a skin they're in with their gender identities? How do we work that? So a lot of the young men and women who I work with here at Vanderbilt for the last 15 years, as well as the young boys and girls I work with out in the community, I think about that in a red bike moment. What is your moment and how do I take this theoretical model and tie it back into Ali's journey. So I do that with a lot of different athletes, starting all the way back with none of Jack Johnson, but there was a uh, Vilas, uh, Vilas, did anybody know a guy named Major Taylor? Major Taylor was a bicycle racer back from Indianapolis, first international world champion of any color. He would ride down the streets in these bicycle races through the streets of London or wherever, and they would throw broom handles through his bike for spike spokes and stuff like that. So Major Taylor was one. There was also a jockey who still has the winningest uh, percent record of all jockeys of all time. Uh, uh, and he also ended up making a moment. That's a whole different talk another time. Anyway, what I try to do is take these athletes, including Wilma Rudolph, include, including uh, folks like um, uh, Arthur Ashe, and a lot of these other athletes that they look at and say, how did they do what they did? And Ali is one of the quintessential people that I use in terms of translating that into language that they can understand. Okay, that's how I look at it academically with education as a background, sports, and, and those other kind of psychosocial, emotional things. Okay. Questions, thoughts? No question now? Yeah, we're open for questions. Yeah, we've got time for about ten minutes. Question. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I think that really. Uh, or his supporter from uh, Sugar Ray Robinson. But at the same time, Boyd Patterson was a great champion, I think, in 758. He didn't seem, in my reading, I like, like consider Boyd Patterson a great black champion or a champion of his race. Did I ever talk about Boyd Patterson ever? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they were rivals, you know, and um, so I'll. I'll use the story as an example here. After uh, Ali wins the championship in 64 against Sonny, Sonny Liston, by this time, Floyd Patterson is really a broken down fighter. Now they're gonna fight in 65, Patterson and Ali, but Patterson shouldn't have gotten in the ring. He had a bad back. In that moment, between 64 and 65, Patterson proclaims that Ali, or you would call him Clay, would use his Muslim name, was a dupe for the Nation of Islam, and he was a dangerous role model for black youth in particular, 
and that, and that Cassius Clay had turned his back on the Civil Rights Movement. And we have to understand that Floyd Patterson was a Catholic. He was an integrationist. Muhammad Ali is a Muslim and a black nationalist. They're on the, these poles of the black freedom struggle. So when Floyd Patterson announces, I'm going to bring the heavyweight title back to America, he's saying something about Muhammad Ali's religion and his politics and his place in America. And we shouldn't forget either that in 64, Martin Luther King declared that Cassius Clay was the total opposite of what, quote unquote, we are fighting for, this Christian-led integrationist movement. And so I, I point to Patterson, I point to King in this period of 64 to 65 to, to sort of demonstrate how there, within the black community, Ali was polarizing. Now having said that, fast forward to 1967, when Ali has refused induction in the military service, and he says that I'm a conscious objector on religious grounds, really based on the first major black celebrity to make this kind of statement. Who comes to his side? Martin Luther King. At this moment in King's life, he is someone who also becomes a major voice of opposition against the war, even at the expense of criticism within his own circle of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And at, the, at that same moment in 1967, Martin Luther King, he appears at a press conference with Harry Edwards in New York in support of the Olympic boycott movement. And so I tell you this to remind you of two things. Number one, we should not sanitize and diminish the complexity of King and Ali to create these simplistic narratives that puts them in these different ideological and religious boxes. They're far more complicated than that. In 64, King didn't feel like he could trust what Cassius Clay represented, what he said. By 67, they had found common ground, right? And so that's important to understand that this was a rapidly moving time, and it's, it's crucial in understanding that, that Ali meant different things to different people at different times, and that could be said in terms of his relation with Floyd Patterson and Martin Luther King. I'd like to add on to that, that that continues into the early 1970s when he fights against uh, Ernie Terrell. Ernie Terrell was another person who would not call him by his name. He's been Muhammad Ali for quite a while now. In 1971, when he comes back, he's still calling him Cassius Clay. And he beats him into, so he shuts his eyes. And then around eight, he's dancing around saying, what's my name? That's where the book, what's my name, fool, comes from. He's beating him until his eyes are shut. He looks like a walnut inside of his eyelids. And he just would not uh, say it. And then, of course, at the, at, the end of this, at the end of this fight, he wins. But the whole conversation was not about all of the rabbit punching that was happening with Terrell, all the kidney shots, all the little groin shots. I get one for real. One of the little <laughs> groin shots that we're doing on. But what the conversation then was about was what, how he was acting in the ring. He was not acting like a gentleman in the ring. Wait, you're a pugilist. You're in there trying to not literally punch a person so much that they actually fall or submit. That's the name of the game. So that continues on for some time uh, with these fighters. And he said, I'm going to do to you what I did to Floyd Patterson. So that was another uh, person who just did not. And, that there, there does, and one thing that a lot of folks do outside of the community, it's not to think that uh, black Americans or whatever the code that was given to us at whatever period of time in history, a one monolithic group. And that's where we get, uh, we all have different ideologies, different political beliefs. We all have different, very, just like any other group of folks. But we want to say, oh, they're black, we know them. They're just that group. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, a, a couple things. Uh, and when we talk about the, 19, the, um, the protests, the 1968 Olympics during the uh, medal ceremony when John Carlos Reagan's fist, um, with two, two athletes did, at, also at that Olympics, um, George Foreman, I believe, won the gold medal. Uh, who we know well from grills, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> At the time, he was parading around the ring waving a small American flag. We seemed antithetical to not only the spirit of the time, but uh, definitely all he represented, in fact. That would be my, my, my first thing. My, my second is more of a question than a statement. Um, 
It has to do with uh, when he when I'll be stripped of his title by mm -hmm. first by the New York State Athletic Commission, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, was that? And I'm sure they, I'm sure they coached. Uh, I, I haven't really studied that specifically, but I'm sure they uh, that was coached. That the action was coached in the fact that it was the anti-war sentiment that caused the commission um, to uh, strip him of his title and rob him of his prime years as, yeah. a, as a boxer. Well, is that just a smokescreen? I mean, was it not more simply uh, overt racism or not overt, but racism that was uh, sublimated um, and hidden behind a sort of a pro-war sentiment? So the New York State Athletic Commission would eventually be forced in court to give him his title back because they had given licenses to men who had been convicted of crimes. Ali was not convicted, right? They gave license to murderers, to rapists, and other men who committed violent crimes. So the court found that the, the, the New York State Olympic discriminated against Ali for his religious and political views, and so that's the short answer to your question. Um, the other thing goes back to these types. You know, as Dr. Whiting said, you know, when you think about the images of black athletes throughout the 20th century. Floyd Patterson was embraced by white America. So when Ali was pummeling him in the ring, what did he say to Floyd Patterson? Come on, white America. Come on, white America. And in that way, he was not only emasculating him, but questioning his blackness. And throughout his career, Ali would denigrate his black opponents. He said awful things to Joe Frazier, comparing him to a, a gorilla, calling him an Uncle Tom. All of these things. And the George, irony is... George became white. Yeah, right. <laughs> George Floyd became white. The irony is, while he would joke about his white opponents, he was never quite as cruel to them as he was to his black opponents. When he fought against Jerry Quarry in his comeback fight in 1970, you know, he called him the great white hope. It was a little bit more of an innocent play on the racial tension. He wasn't going after his identity or his manhood in the same way that he went after these other fighters. A lot of people say that... Ali, for his something else, Ali used to love wrestling. <laughs> he used to love wrestling, you know, the jumping off the rope wrestling and uh, uh, Andre the Giant wrestling and all that kind of stuff. Ric Flair was one of his favorite people. His mouth, his style of clothes, <laughs> the bathrobes, all that kind of stuff. He would say that a lot of that would come from looking at that. Now, I think about music, and I think about the music soundtrack of my life. I think it's very instrumental in how we grew up. And I think about the music that was playing there, then we don't have the same kind of uh, Motown, Detroit coming out stuff that we had later on. But during the early years, it was very much integrated kind of music. Matter of fact, you couldn't get your music played over the, uh, over the record player if you were a certain player, unless a white musician had taken it and then played it. I'm not talking about Elvis or anybody, but you understand what I mean. <laughs> so those were the kind of things I was in. And so we have somebody like Ali who, as his title is being stripped and given back and now coming back in there, he looks at Jerry Quarry, and though he said Great White Hope, we have to think about the original notion of the Great White Hope with Jack Johnson as they searched around America to find somebody and they found, you know, somebody who used to be come out of, he shouldn't came out of, uh, out of the cornfields either to fight uh, Jack Johnson. But, and he also, Muhammad Ali takes a lot of his fighting from Jack Johnson. You know, Ali's a great, he's got that left jab that just stays in your face all day long, but at the same time, he also paws at your gloves. So as you're punching, he would take Terrell, and he would actually, his hands up, he would actually catch his gloves, he'd measure his hand before they even got, and he got to a point where he couldn't stand by hands and punch, you just lean back two inches out of the way. When you put your hand back, you've got something to taste. You know, this was a classic picture, right? I kind of, we're just talking about this, and I want to introduce you, have you introduce yourself, and I think it's important that you're here. Uh, this was a great shot of one of the knockout blows that Frazier was throwing at. Frazier goes out to win this fight. This is a fight where Frazier breaks Ali's jaw, as a matter of fact, and then knocks him out. So this was one of those uh, iconic fights. But he's got to a point as a fighter where he could just stand there and fight and just do one of these things. He's like, his back foot was always cranked and he'd come back in and spring back forward and stick that thing out there, an 80, 82 inch jab on you. So Ali was great for that. So there's a lot in that coming back, that great white hope story that's there. And you're right, he didn't do that. But what he also liked to do was to psychologically mess with his opponents. And calling a black man a Tom, come on, that just blows you away. Turn in somebody who's got an afro and George, uh, Joe Frazier, uh, George Foreman, mm -hmm. in Zaire, he shows up with a 
German Shepherd after the dogs had been chasing people in Africa with German Shepherds. Oh, that was all he needed. He had farmer overalls on. He looked like an overseer. It was curtains for him from the beginning. Joe, George Foreman should have knocked his block off at that fight. No doubt about it. But all of that got to his head. They didn't almost cancel the fight because they hit practice, Joe, uh, George Foreman did. They had a cut over his eye, but they actually stayed there a few extra weeks, which of course worked on his brain. Muhammad Ali was a master craftsman in, in all he did. Side story, if I go just to, real quick. Yeah, go with the foreman, the fight in Zaire, I have a friend who's writing a biography of Foreman, mm -hmm. and he's been interviewing Foreman many, many times. And Foreman believes to this day that his own trainer, Dick Sadler, spiked his water, and that he got weak in the legs, and that the reason for that is that he bet on the fight and put money on Ali, who was a serious underdog in that fight in 74. So this day, Foreman believes that, you know, that Ali, not that Ali cheated, but that Ali won because his own corner man undermines his ability to fight with him. Whether or not it's true or not, who knows? <laughs> I want to give everybody a chance to um, take a look at the items that you brought and also make sure that we can let the police buy one as we promised. But uh, if you have questions for speakers, you can come down and ask them. But I did want to introduce Christy Halbert, who is uh, a former U.S. Olympic boxing coach. And <laughs> community here at Vanderbilt. Did you have something you wanted to say about this picture? I, I just wanted to say, uh, why did you look good up there? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I didn't actually own five black girls. <laughs> I didn't buy them or earn them. I just own my boy. <laughs> I've been fighting since about 14, actually. So one thing I want to think about as a kid, because growing up in Boston, 1976, something happens that takes our attention away from Muhammad Ali. And it happens again in 1979, again in 1982. It almost immortalizes this person, Rocky. The whole Rocky series comes out right when he's coming back and he's in this thing, and it almost overshadows. It's like he's a real boxer. <laughs> Sylvester Stallone became real. They put actually put a, a, a actual statue that I saw in the middle of Philadelphia. You know, so those things for kids who are growing up is very confusing. Because playing cowboys and Indians, Muhammad Ali always wanted to be a cowboy with him and his brother. Think about that now. Psychological damage that you want to be a cowboy so you can kill the Indians. So there's a lot of those little subtle things as you read and you start looking at stuff. That's why I like to talk to historians because they send you places to look at things that just you never see anywhere else. We're going to have one question up here, and I have one person who wants to also ask something. So why don't you go ahead because you had your hand up a couple of times. Did, because uh, it's about Kaepernick. Uh, in the NFL yeah. and Ali in the boxing commission. Yeah. I mean, how close is that? Well, yeah. right. His lawyers so are about to find out. Right? They part of the, the NFL, club. and they're going to force uh, them to uh, to talk. You know, they're going to get emails. They're going to have messages, and they're going to find out whether or not they can prove collusion. Um, we'll see. I think. It's very difficult, even if, if you're not a lawyer, um, and you're not looking at this from a legal perspective, I would say it's hard to believe there was not some kind of concerted effort to prevent him from returning to the NFL when they're bringing guys like Nathan Peterman who throws four interceptions in one game and he continues to get another job. I mean, guys who haven't played quarterback in years getting NFL jobs, it's impossible to believe that there wasn't a concerted effort to deny him an opportunity. Yeah. It just is. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, we discussed the Floyd Patterson issue, but I would have Archie Moore, who was also a great champion of the 50s. He didn't even have that same contempt. He just said, they kissed an old man. Yeah. Whole that fight was in 62. Right. Okay. And so, you know, part of the sort of the timing yeah. and, and where yeah. Cassius Clay is politically, where Muhammad Ali is politically, you know, when he fights Archie Moore, his career is going this way. He's just starting. He's not even seen yet as a serious contender for the heavyweight title. Um, but he understood the art of performance. Um, as he said, you know, borrowing from the world of wrestling, he happily played the role of the villain because boxing was dying in the early 60s. You know, men had died in the ring, there was corruption, investigations from the Senate. He saw himself as the savior to resuscitate the sport. And to do that required being outrageous. And he learned that lesson from gorgeous George Wagner. So, you know, and so, you know, he, he George, gorgeous George always keeps sassing. You know, 
People will pay to see a villain and boo you. It catches a light bulb when I was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> so, anyhow, I digress. Huh? Good to work with you, man. Thanks, guys. And thanks, everybody, for coming. The next event is uh, February 28th on White Cost and the Olympics. Uh, David and I were to present that one together. Uh, so that will be a poignant day. But uh, thanks again. And uh, this was shot online. I will be posted online. If you missed any of the sessions that have been uh, taking place this year, they're all on a, a nice uh, website, vanderbilt.edu slash sports and society. And then reintroduce Pam Morgan from the Vanderbilt Library, who has uh, put together a cool uh, companion to the series where she's identified books and movies and other resource materials that uh, relate to each of the topics. And you can find that on the, the Vanderbilt.edu slash sports society website. So thanks for coming. Yeah.